It's 9 a.m. in Beijing and Hong Kong. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets China Open. I'm Annabelle Drawlers with Yvonne Mann. Our top stories this morning, Asian stocks fall following declines on Wall Street as traders weigh prospects for big tech ahead of NVIDIA's earnings. China's Quan Funds drawing scrutiny. Stock exchanges freeze one money manager's account after it dumped $360 million of shares within a minute. And HSBC is set to report results with analysts focusing on the impact of China's economic slowdown and potential for new share buybacks. So there's definitely those earnings. You have the videos we talked about here. Uh, and then again, there's still plenty of event risk. The Fed minutes when we're still trying to determine whether the next move from the Fed is going to be a hike or <laughs> actually a cut here. We still got to talk about these China markets still struggling to gain a bit of traction despite that bigger than expected move from the LPR yesterday. Yeah, that's right. You take a look at the Golden Dragon Index overnight and yeah. it just tells you that that rally that we had leading up to Chinese New Year, perhaps it's starting to dissipate and investors not really convinced that we're seeing any sort of recovery in the consumption story in China. But you mentioned, of course, NVIDIA, and that is really the big yeah. focus in the session so far. And you take a look at the market action and it tells you just how much investors are really anticipating these numbers. I mean, I, as we were just saying in the ad break there, every time we have an NVIDIA report over the past year or so, we're saying, really, can they live up to the hype? And yeah. that's the big question ahead of these numbers. But given that, that focus on it, we are seeing tech really leading the drop. And you can see that reflected in SoftBank. We just had Taiwan coming online. And you can see as well, TSMC is 1% uh, down. So, so outpacing that drop that we're seeing for the Taiwan benchmark there. But let's change on because earnings, not just the focus with NVIDIA. Australia's earnings season very much underway in the session. Rio Tinto, one of the big ones we're going to be watching. Those numbers actually are due after hours in the session today, ahead of the London market open. But uh, we did see Rio Tinto inking a very big pack for the supply of renewable energy. So that was announced ahead of those results. Uh, other markets coming online, and you can just see that broad pressure really coming through in the session so far. Uh, moving on to what we're seeing in the Treasury space, and we're just not really seeing too much action. We do have Treasuries one hour into trading so far. The Japanese yen, of course, one to note, uh, given that yen weakness that we're continuing to see and jawboning from Japanese officials has been just a, pretty much a hallmark of what we get there in the currency markets. A quick check on what we're seeing ahead of the Chinese market open in terms of futures so far. Uh, we had been setting up for, again, more weakness coming through in the session. Uh, question marks over, as we said, the health of the Chinese economic story and really whether, whether investors are, are playing into that. Yeah, and certainly we've seen some moves here, of course, obviously with that surprise, uh, bigger than expected record cut uh, when it comes to the LPR. Not enough. You know, we saw what happened during the session. There was initial lift, some of these property shares, that was trimmed off a bit. Uh, the, the latest was these quant funds, uh, one of them which was froze, frozen, just given the fact that they were selling stocks on Monday quite heavily here. So maybe some more signs of policymakers really trying to stop I guess this, this selling pressure that we're seeing across these markets. Uh, we're, we're focused a little bit more on, on some of these loans that, and these whitelist developers that's been played out according to CCTV. So we're still focusing on developers here today. Earnings from HSBC, Trip.com, Northbound Flow is certainly one to watch out for. And of course, uh, this rally that we've seen in the offshore RMB that's been happening for, I think, four or five days now. Uh, we'll see how that all plays out. Nomura had a pretty interesting call, still staying long on the RMB against the basket here. We also have some calls on whether, you know, what the next steps for policymakers are going to be after that LPR. Is it, does it mean that they have more firepower in the back half? Nomura seems to think so, Bell. Yeah, that was really one of the questions that came out of it. If we are seeing any sort of recovery in the Chinese consumer, does that remove the need to yeah. then have any sort of rate reduction? But yep. that's certainly something to be tracking. And as we said, that weakness that we're really setting up for in the yep. session. And we got Goldman's uh, consumer research co-head joining mm. us as well. Talk a little bit more about that holiday data as well. Let's bring in our first guest of the morning, Stephen Roach, senior fellow at Yale Law School and former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia. I also want to bring in our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. Stephen Roach, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, you know, I want to get to that op-ed piece that's stirring quite a bit of debate uh, uh, in here in Hong Kong. But first and foremost, I have to talk to you about what we've been seeing across these Chinese markets, where we've seen policymakers try to throw everything from, you know, rescuing this market, support measures to the property market, a, a deeper than expected cuts, and it's not really doing enough. How have we seen the worst in this equity market in China or are more declines in store? Well, fortunately, um, 
as an economist, I'm, I'm not uh, going to venture out into making um, an equity market call. The, the Chinese market and the Hong Kong market have been in a, uh, a vicious bear market for a number of years. And, um, you know, it's very much tied to the concerns that investors have about the medium to long term prospects of the Chinese economy. I think uh, there's a general belief that the short term cyclical pressures uh, can be effectively addressed uh, by the same types of policies that Beijing has used uh, in addressing cyclical problems in the past, uh, both proactive fiscal policy and um, you know, prudent monetary policy, as they like to say. So I don't think it's a question of falling well short of, uh, you know, the, the growth target that's likely to be released uh, uh, next month uh, at the National People's Congress. But it's this medium to longer term outlook where the economy is in the grips of uh, really powerful structural pressures. Uh, there's now a significant whiff of deflation uh, and, you know, the property market sees no easy bottom. Uh, the local government financing vehicles are under pressure and uh, the actions the government has taken to address these uh, serious issues are de minimis uh, thus far. So I think that those are the, the big issues that investors are looking at right now. Hi, Stephen. Stephen Engel here. Always good to see you. Uh, you know, again, uh, Yvonne alluded to the op-ed piece that you're going to we're going to talk about Hong Kong in just a minute. But in that op-ed, you did mention about the China factor and you talked about debt deflation demographics. Uh, and that leads to the next question about the policy path going forward for Chinese leaders. Uh, we had, of course, uh, yesterday or the day before, Claudio Perón of Bank of America come on and say, look, China's facing a crisis of confidence, no doubt, especially Especially in the private sector, but also policy credibility. Would you agree with that, or is the tackling of, of and de-risking and deleveraging a prudent course right now? Well, Steve, uh, yeah, it's always great to see you. You don't look a day younger than when I first met you, maybe <laughs> 25 years ago. Um, a day older, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, but um, <laughs> you, you get the general uh, drift of it. But I, th I think the um, uh, the confidence issue is is a very serious one, especially insofar as it bears on uh, the private sector, which remains under uh, very intense pressure from. Uh, Beijing. They're on again, off again in terms of the tech sector and uh, now back on again. Uh, and <clears throat> I think entrepreneurs are uh, now facing a much more challenging environment in terms of um, starting up new companies and in <clears throat> uh, maximizing uh, the type of return on a risk adjusted basis that has been such a powerful force in driving uh, the Chinese economy over the last uh, 15 years. And Beijing has not done a lot to really uh, inject uh, confidence back into uh, the private sector entrepreneurs and the, uh, the new businesses they are attempting to start up. Um, in terms of you know credibility, uh, I don't think it's that that there's a lot of doubt that the actions that are being taken are legitimate and serious. Uh, I just think that there's a general consensus that I would agree with that they're not enough in this this climate. Stephen. Uh, hold that thought. We'll have plenty more with Stephen Roach there, a senior fellow at Yale Law School. Of course, we're going to talk and dig a little bit deeper into his op-ed piece about why it pains him to say that Hong Kong is over. Bell. 
Yeah, well, Vaughn, just uh, about 10 minutes into the session so far for Singapore markets and one big no mover that we're tracking so far is Singapore Airlines. You can see that drop there. Uh, actually, the airline had some pretty good numbers because they saw net, net income rising 5% from a year earlier uh, and also revenue rising to an all-time quarterly high. But the focus and the reason we're seeing that drop today is because investors are really looking at passenger yields. Uh, that's an indicator of revenue, but they're continuing to come under pressure, so there's increased competition, a geopolitical economic uncertainties, and that is really the focus there. But we'll have more ahead, uh, as Yvonne was saying, Stephen Roach joining us in the next block, and of course, counting down to the open of markets in Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and we are setting up for a bit of weakness ahead of that. All right, checking China futures here today, still in a bit of red this morning, down about one third of one percent. We'll see how the open plays out here. We're seeing a flat Renmin being holding on to the strength that we've seen of late. 241, yet bond market not really going anywhere here this morning. Let's bring by Stephen Roach, senior fellow at Yale Law School and former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia. Recently wrote an op-ed piece for the FT that did stir quite a bit of debate. At least we can say that here in Hong Kong. It pains me to say, he says, to admit it, but Hong Kong is now over, has gained a lot of traction online. He joins us again, Stephen Roach. We, we, we laid it on the introduction, Stephen Roach. You used to be the chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia. You, you were, you know, Hong Kong was your home for, for many years. And for you to say this is quite bold. And I, and I have to ask you, kind of, what's changed in your mind to, think, to really say that Hong Kong is over? Well, first of all, um, Yvonne, I, I want to say that I, I, I've always loved the city of Hong Kong in terms of its spirit, uh, the, the sense of tradition mixed with uh, a, a very modern approach uh, to life, the people. I have great friends, or at least I did. Uh, uh, and um, yet, you know, when I look at the, the circumstances over the last several years, um, uh, that were freshened up when I came back to Hong Kong early last year and had three three visits in, in 2023, which is pretty much at odds with the impression of, that some of your politicians have been trying to convey, who they claim I haven't been there uh, uh, in, in years. The um, I think the wheels started to come off with the uh, the demonstrations in 2019, uh, the COVID-related lockdowns uh, uh, were an increasingly serious problem for uh, the mainland as well as uh, Hong Kong, uh, and the the exodus of uh, of talent uh, and now of some companies. Uh, was increasingly disconcerting. And as I spoke with my former colleagues and business associates repeatedly in 2023, they were, um, I think, stretching uh, for uh, uh, an answer from somebody like me who knows Hong Kong quite well to tell them everything was okay. And the more they push me on it, the, the greater the sense of an ease I detected from them. And, you know, so I think, Stephen, um, yeah. St Stephen, what are the consequences then mm. of a city if, uh, you know, it comes true uh, that you predict it's over? What, what are the consequences of a, of a city like Hong Kong, which plays that bridge role between East and West as a capital raising center for Hong Kong for funds to flow freely? But in your op-ed, you mentioned the bifurcated world, geopolitically, supply chains, trade is a massive part of this economy. What are going to be the consequences of Hong Kong being over, as you say, property market slump, stock market slump, what are those consequences? Well, I, th I think, Steve, the dynamism of, of Hong Kong, which impressed me so much, you know, when I first vis visited the city uh, in the 1980s, uh, a, a city driven uh, by uh, risk-taking uh, entrepreneurs, by the, the 
the role as a gateway, capital raising gateway to, to China, those, those are um, characteristics of Hong Kong that were unique at the time. But now I think they're uh, all uh, very much um, uh, at risk uh, going forward, in part because China uh, is is in trouble and Hong Kong has been for a long time a levered play on China. And also, as you alluded to, and as I wrote uh, in the piece, Hong Kong is trapped in the crossfire between uh, the U.S. and China as the conflict uh, intensifies. And many of Hong Kong's closest trading partners uh, are being forced to choose sides in this trade war, tech war, cold war uh, between the U.S. and China, and they're opting uh, to, to go the route of the U.S., and that leaves China right. uh, Hong Kong in trouble. So, so Stephen, what, what would you suggest that Beijing can do to fix Hong Kong's problems and to retain that sort of uniqueness that that you that you just reiterated it. You know whether it's you know maintaining a, a common law, independent judicial system, low tariffs, you know free flow of capital. What do you think is essential for Hong Kong to actually maintain its financial status? Look, I think the most important thing that Beijing can can do um, is number one to f fix its own system to get its economy back. Uh, on track uh, to address uh, the structural problems we alluded to earlier uh, in this interview. Uh, and I think that um, you know, Beijing also needs to be, I think, more aggressive and transparent in underscoring its commitment uh, to, um, you know, the one country, two systems model that has given Hong Kong uh, such a long runway to uh, exhibit the type of dynamism that it has become uh, such a powerful force in shaping the whole uh, essence of, of the, um, uh, the Hong Kong system. Hey, Stephen, uh, what can Hong Kong do? You also allude uh, in that op-ed that Hong Kong basically can't do much without the approval of Beijing. You mentioned that uh, sort of um, social media battle you're having with Regina Ip. She is obviously a very strident pro-China and says that essentially the Fed policy has caused a lot of Hong Kong's problems. But is there anything that Hong Kong specifically can do or, or is it helpless? You said in that article, you said Hong Kong is to be remain mired in a trap made in China. But I'll play the devil's advocate here, Steve. I'm asking multiple questions here, I know. <laughs> but it was the protesters who turned violent that really forced the national security law and the, and, and the subsequent actions uh, that it was sort of a problem also born in Hong Kong. Is there anything that Hong Kong can do to change its course? Well, I agree with your characterization of what happened in 2019 that forced Beijing's hand. But, you know, that's, you know, pretty much uh, history at this point, Steve. And, and I, I, Beijing is not, uh, I think, going to relax the imposition of uh, the national security law that it imposed shortly thereafter. Uh, Hong Kong has got to, uh, I think, address its own domestic stability issues. It appears to be doing that through the court system, but um, uh, I think the, the heavy hand of uh, uh, Beijing is much more apparent uh, today, um, you know, in the years after the demonstrations than, than it was before. There, there was a long transition period that was still uh, ahead for uh, Hong Kong between the handover and the uh, the, the the final um, assimilation of Hong Kong uh, into the PRC, and that's been shortened, I think, uh, dramatically. There's still some uh, autonomy that Hong Kong uh, has, but it's it's more limited 
as a result of, of the, the political developments that have occurred. Stephen, are, are your views, do you think, are, are they shared by others here in Hong Kong? I'm just wondering, are, are you getting a sense of, of growing frustration among the people that you talk to? Well, I've had a lot of feedback from my friends and, and former colleagues, and I would say um, the, the feedback is, goes something like the following. I agree with most of you, with, with what most of, most of what you've said, but I still hold out hope uh, that Hong Kong uh, will once again demonstrate the resilience, the capacity to reinvent itself as it has repeatedly uh, in the past. And I had one uh, good friend, um, very well known uh, a figure in Hong Kong say, look, I've heard this before. You're like a broken record. You know, I'm sad to see it coming from you. And just as uh, some of these views were wrong at the time of the handover, you're going to be wrong again. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, I think it's more complex than that. This is not uh, a situation right. that is in any way uh, reminiscent of the, what it was in uh, the late 90s. It's a very different set of circumstances. Sure. Then how can Hong Kong reimagine itself? You alluded to the fact, Stephen, that you and I have known each other for several decades. We've lived through uh, crises here in Hong Kong, whether it was the Asian financial crisis and the subsequent collapse of the property market here. Uh, we had SARS. We had a numerous protests before 2019 as well, the Umbrella Movement, as well as 2013 Article 23 protests. There have been shocks to the system. But if it is fundamentally changed because of Beijing's heavy hand, as you call it, uh, how can and will a city of just 7 million people reimagine itself? It, it's going to be tough. I mean, the, 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 the options that Hong Kong have right now are more limited than they have been at any point, I would say, um, in the last 30 or 40 years. I mean, there, there certainly is the opportunity for Hong Kong to play a, a critical role uh, in the greater Bay Area. But again, that is a, a PRC-centric uh, concept that uh, uh, allows for Hong Kong to play one role when, you know, other cities like uh, Shenzhen and uh, Guangzhou play possibly, um, you know, equally important, if not greater roles. So, you know, Hong Kong is, is uh, I think, at risk of getting marginalized. Um, it still has the talent, the institutional heritage, the rule of law, uh, and you hope that, that all of that remains um, uh, enduring features of, of Hong Kong in the years ahead. But there are, there are many who are asking questions about those very uh, uh, attributes. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us, of course, with your views. Stephen Roach there, senior fellow at Yale Law School. I also want to thank Stephen Engel, our chief North Asia correspondent. Take a look when it comes to your futures board and what we're expecting across this open here today. It looks likely that we could be seeing things down, down about half 1% for 850 futures. Your reference rate just crossing the last couple of minutes or so. 7.10.30, the estimate there was for a 7.18 sort of handle. So it is, once again, a stronger fix from the PBOC. In terms of analyst actions, a leaning, that's one to watch out for. That was a call from Michelle Chang from Goldman. She's joining us in just the next four or five minutes or so to talk us through what her take from this holiday spending data is going to look like, but cut to neutral when it comes to the sports makers like Li Nang. New World Development, CCB coming out with interesting note about the Hong Kong developers. A bit of a mixed picture in terms of what he's seeing, but really rated new underperform when it comes to New World Development. CK Acid rated new outperform when it comes to that firm as well. Well. Yeah, and as you mentioned, that, that, that report as well that we had that uh, China developers are going to be given more funds to, to help finish their unfinished projects. So that is making the developers one of the groups of stocks to watch ahead of the open here. But we're just a couple of minutes out from the start of trading for Hong Kong and also mainland China.
you're watching Bloomberg Markets China Open just a couple of seconds out from the start of trading here and really the setup today isn't looking too great. We didn't have a great session overnight with the Golden Dragon Index on Wall Street and you also had Yvonne that LPR surprise pretty much underwhelming investors yesterday. I mean yeah I mean we thought it was just going to be a, you know five ten basis point cut 25 basis points still doesn't quite cut it. Uh, to really turn around those markets. So it seems like, you know, it's just yearning for more sort of stimulus when it comes to the property market, the like here. So certainly uh, you have very different takes from Nomura and JP Moore, which we'll get to about, yeah. you know, of just what the next steps are going to be. Does this mean that they're going to, you know, ease more aggressively given this surprise move? Or does it mean that they actually don't have too much room because there's a lot of uncertainty about the Fed and clarity around that as well? So certainly there is a lot of factors at play here. We're also counting down to those Fed minutes, NVIDIA earnings on terms of the macro front as well. HS Tech is doing this right now. We're seeing another down day, about three quarters of 1%. The Hang Seng, as well as onshore, we're seeing some declines here, seven tenths of 1% to the downside when it comes to the uh, Shanghai gauges. So certainly it's another day where I guess there's still a bit of disappointment. Uh, we did edge at some gains yesterday, but really it's not as the robust sort of return that really, really everyone's thought of. Uh, CGBs have been pretty much stuck in a range as well. We're at 241 for your Chinese 10 year yield. HS Tech, there you go. We're down more than 1% here right now. Ahead, of course, NVIDIA sank leading up to those results. Maybe there's a bit of vulnerability when it comes to the tech space overall here today. Crude's down. There you go. Iron ore down for a second day here. We're down 3.6%. Uh, in terms of what we're all, what else we're watching out for, it seems like it's all sectors in the red here. In particular, it's the Macau Gaming. So some of the stocks that really kind of gained quite a bit here last week after the reopen, are, we are seeing a bit of profit taking out, it seems, here today. In terms of individual moves, we talked about what we heard from uh, policymakers here at CCTV talking about banks approving uh, 123 billion renminbi of loans for property projects, so potentially more help on its way, not doing too much when it comes to some of these property names. Uh, it was basically trimming gains yesterday uh, on, uh, on some of these developers here today. Country Garden, though, is still lower by about 3%. We're also watching earnings, 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 so not just NVIDIA, but it's HSBC, it's Hansang Bank, it's Trip.com, so more in the consumer space as well. Uh, HSBC, it's all about really what, 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 what loan charges are going to look like, what the exposure to the property market in China is going to look like, maybe a, a dividend you know, news as well. That stock's up about seven tenths of 1% leading up to that result. Trip.com, there you go, down 1%. Heidi Lau came up with some prelim numbers. I think it met expectations, though, is that full year net income at least 4.4 billion renminbi. Bell. Yeah, and I think what we're going to be really watching for as well out of those Trip.com numbers in particular is just sort of any indications we got in terms of the pickup in recovery or consumption in mainland China after the Lunar New Year holiday? Do we get any signals from that in the earnings call, for yeah. instance? Uh, this, of course, just looking at some of those numbers, and as we discussed over the course of this week, it, at a headline level, uh, consumption looked like it was recovering a little bit. But yeah. when we dug into the details, actually, perhaps it was a little bit more patchy, the numbers instead. But let's discuss uh, with Michelle Chang. She's co-head of Asia Consumer Research at Goldman Sachs. Michelle joining us this morning in Hong Kong. And yeah, just kick us off. What was what was your takeaway from these numbers that came out? Yeah, I think initial tech is we think the number is solid. Because before the holiday, I think market has been really bearish. Uh, given uh, post the golden week uh, in fourth quarter last year, uh, consumption has been seeing a significant slowdown. Uh, so before the holiday, given the high base last year, I think uh, market has have a pretty low expectation. So looking at the data, definitely travel service uh, led growth. Uh, um, travel is increased, uh, visitation increased by like 38 percent and 19 percent higher than 2019's level. And looking at the, the uh, uh, travel tourist revenue is uh, also 9% higher than pre-COVID level is, uh, is also uh, one of the peakest level in the past few holidays. And uh, uh, even on the goods consumption where we see a lot of concerns, uh, looking at a lot of uh, different cities, uh, provinces, data points uh, on the ground, it's around like mid to like teens levels growth. It's definitely much better than what we have been seeing in the past few months, only 3-4% CAGR. So I would say that data points uh, is better than fear and driven by service. Having said that, I think uh, there's definitely a lot of debate. I think one is still the spending power. Yeah. yeah. So if you are really uh, arguing that the per capita spending is still 9% below the 2019 level, and looking at the uh, ticket uh, price in box office and high nice ticket spending, you can still argue that uh, spending power is not there yet. Uh, but I think relatively, uh, by certain sector, like if you look at uh, apparel, sports, or wholesale price in spirits, it's uh, relatively resilient. Mm. So uh, all in 
though I think uh, it's not uh, like 100% uh, 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 good, but I think at least we still see some encouraging data point among the, day, uh, among the holidays. Um, does it lead to a more broader recovery in consumption? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I think uh, I think one of the reasons uh, the past few days you see stock market has been pretty challenging. Uh, on the one side, I think some of the expectations has been built in uh, last week. But on the other side, I think aside from the spending power question, uh, the sustainability of the recovery, I think that's still a question mark. Yeah. And uh, looking at the past uh, few holidays in fourth quarter last year and also in uh, uh, second quarter uh, post the Labor Day holiday, we do see a, a big trend post COVID is uh, consumers tend to concentrate their spending during the holidays, but post holiday we will see a uh, weakness. So, so far this we still need to monitor, but uh, in 2024, uh, while we have a more like a uh, uh, cautious view on the overall consumption, but we believe uh, travel service will still lead the growth uh, given it's not really fully recovered to the pre-COVID level. But for good spending, uh, since it, it's already back to pre-COVID level, so the CAGR growth rate, it may still take time to, to, to uh, be uh, accelerating. I'm wondering, because you mentioned that apparel and sports, they've been resilient, and we know that there's sort of an emerging trend of how people are using their time over the Lunar New Year holiday as well, mm -hmm. preferring to perhaps go on a trip rather than spending mm -hmm. traditional time with family. How permanent are some of these changes post-COVID, do you mm. think? Mm. Yeah, so this year at least we see that the service-driven uh, category will still be good. Yeah, because on the one side, people have been um, uh, locking down in the, at, at home uh, for many years. And even some of the friends, and that's the very first time they go back home this time. Yeah, so uh, service uh, in different category, including travel, catering, or even like a, a, a box office, I think they are still relatively decent. Uh, but for good spending, I think... Uh, it's, it's a mix between the volume and ASP uh, changes. So in the past, uh, when China is uh, consumption is going through a premiumization trend, you are seeing a very good balance of volume and pricing growth. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, some category, you might still see volume growth because penetration is not there yet. But pricing uh, uh, trajectory might be capped. So yeah. that's why the overall growth rate will be still slower be the, than before. Of course, we've been talking about this economy that's still in deflation. I mean, how entrenched... Mm. Is it across the consumer space here right now? Are we likely to see prices trend even lower? Mm. And what impact is that going to have on earnings? It actually depends on sectors. We still see some encouraging data point on the uh, premiumization trend in certain category. Mm. For example, uh, looking at spirits, uh, the super high end still doing much better, uh, still have a good uh, market share again in uh, beer because the overall ASP versus other market, even you consider the disposable income, uh, beer in China is still pretty cheap. And so they are still seeing a decent premiumization trend. But for some sectors uh, uh, like uh, uh, restaurants, uh, this is a this is a sector very interesting just in between staple and discretionary. So it's most sensitive to the pricing. Yeah. And starting from like early la uh, last year, 23, we hear uh, quite a few companies, no matter you are like YMC, uh, KFC. We, we talked to her, Joey Watt. It was 50 bucks for a pizza. Remember B? Yeah. Like yeah. 20, $20 for a bucket of chicken. I mean, it, it, it just seems like this price, war, she didn't want to call it a price war, but mm. it seems like it is a price war in some ways. Uh, yes or no. I think on yeah. the one side, if they, uh, uh, many com big companies, they want to penetrate into lower to your city. So actually, they have more chance uh, to, uh, to, to offer these value for money products, still decent uh, uh, product quality, yeah. but uh, not sacrificing margin, but can fulfill the demand in the lower tier city. So, so I think overall, uh, rational definitely we see some um, price competition, but also it's a combination of the, the, the big brands, big chance they have uh, better opportunities in the white space in lower tier cities. A lot of the investors that we speak to are really waiting on some sort of sustained pickup in Chinese consumption to, to tempt them back into the market. And we know a lot of that really hinges on the health of the property sector. Mm -hmm. So far, the measures that have come through haven't really been that effective. Mm -hmm. What else do you think is needed to try and reinvigorate this, this consumption? Yeah, this indeed is one of the, the, the biggest questions we always hear uh, from investors. Um, on the one side, uh, consumption is always a later cycle uh, sector. You need to see uh, the, the, the property sector or other like uh, physical uh, economic activities uh, uh, improving and then people will show confidence uh, to spend. And I think for, for China consumption, the, the challenge right now is probably not the wealth itself. Actually, if you look at the uh, saving rate, it has been moving up significantly yeah. in the past 15, 20 years. Yeah, so in the past, I think people spend, uh, save more for property, but now even you see a lot of a uh, property market housing burden is lowering, but people still not spend because they, are, they don't have 
have confidence yet. Yeah. yeah so uh, I think uh, uh, initially we still need to see other industry activities picking up first, and so that consumers will restore the confidence and then they, they will be more willing to spend. Real quickly, how do I position around the space right now? It mm. seems like you're still quite bullish when it comes to liquors. I, I <laughs> think it's more balanced. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, when we uh, talk about our 2024 consumer, cons consumer outlook, uh, we highlight five key catalysts uh, in the space. So value for money, still the focus, and uh, property market sentiment, uh, and margin profile, uh, also the product cycle, and also going global uh, to, to figure out some white space. So um, uh, for the subsector wise, we like beer, we like durable, leading durable, value retail, uh, and uh, also the, the exporters. Yeah, so basically for those companies we have, uh, which has a more balanced uh, growth opportunities uh, in, in this year. I want to get your reaction because you had a call out Goldman Sachs on leaning mm. and actually we're seeing the market reaction coming through today because the stock's down as much as 2%. So now that you're here... You're moving the market. <laughs> yeah, <show>. exactly. <laughs> Whilst you're moving the markets and you're here on the China Open Show, tell us what was behind that call. Uh, I think maybe we can uh, uh, move it more top-down uh, perspective. We, we, today we also published a big report on the margins uh, analysis. I think the thing is uh, we do see... Uh, everyone knows that the, the consumption growth it has been slowing down, but... Uh, one big uh, debate this year, I, we think, will be margin because a lot of Chinese company they have a pretty decent margin, uh, and also even compared with the global market, China, uh, uh, for, even for global companies, their business in China, the margin is much higher than the global market. Yeah. yeah so in this environment, everyone is still uh, keen to gain shares. So this means that uh, they will have bullets to spend, and these might impact uh, the margin profile. So that's why uh, we see multiple companies uh, they may spend more on AMP or the the promotion activities will be uh, will be higher, uh, and in some cases uh, there will be some channel shift that will impact the margin. So net net, I think this uh, lead to our view that for selective company they may see higher margin risks uh, this year. Michelle, great to have you, Michelle Chang, there, co-head of the Asia Consumer Research at Goldman Sachs. Fantastic work, and of course, as we talk, leading shares back up again. We're <laughs> up to one percent. Continue to watch that space here. CSI 300 is doing this. We're still seeing negative territory for Shanghai, but offshore we've actually seen a bit of a turnaround around here just about 11 minutes into the session. Hang Seng up six tenths of one percent. This is Bloomberg. All right, still big earnings day. HSBC is set to report earnings later on, and analysts are expected to focus on the potential for its new share buyback program and, of course, the bank's outlook when it comes to China's economic growth. More or less bring in our banking and fintech senior analyst from Bloomberg Intelligence, Francis Chen, joining us here on set. What are you expecting, Francis? Uh, well, uh, I, I, I think the market may focus on uh, the asset quality issue yeah. uh, in mainland China, in particular for commercial real estate, which is also a big problem in the United States uh, recently. And, and uh, the bank has uh, been making uh, uh, quite a bit of provisions on, on that item. Yeah. Uh, we want to see the outlook uh, for 2024. Uh, Hong Kong's uh, real estate, uh, commercial real estate uh, uh, exposure, mortgages, uh, some other pockets of uh, uh, stress, maybe. Um, in terms of uh, revenue, we are, uh, are looking uh, for, for management's comments on uh, uh, the potential margin performance this year against the backdrop of a potential uh, uh, pivot of Fed fund rates in the United States in 2024. So uh, those will be the key operating items, and share buyback and dividends are obviously mm. uh, um, something investors are looking very closely on. What about any sort of guidance we get in terms of business disposals or acquisitions, the outlook for Hong Kong, or these other things that you're going to be watching closely? Um, I, I think uh, uh, the loan risk in Hong Kong could be something that uh, we, we want to watch out for. Um, in fact, the bank has uh, uh, formed a committee to uh, oversee the risk uh, for the Hang Seng Bank unit. Uh, yeah, it was announced a few days ago. Obviously, there's another item about the cost control, uh, new bonus system for the junior staff uh, in the bank. Uh, it was released also a few days ago. How do you think, uh, in terms of what else you're watching, because you mentioned that, that, that race between Singapore and Hong Kong, and you do have a big report out today on yeah. that. Just talk us through what you found at the headline level. In the headline level, uh, uh, Singapore uh, walked out of uh, the pandemic period uh, earlier than Hong Kong. 
uh, they reopened uh, about one year earlier, uh, and then they do gain uh, a lot of wealth flows, uh, business flows from multinational companies, mm -hmm. and, and the progress is, is uh, uh, pretty, um, you know, obvious uh, that has been becoming uh, the international city in Asia. Uh, Hong Kong, obviously, uh, it has been dragged a little bit uh, by a later reopening from, from the COVID control in China. Uh, but uh, we, we see it catching up in terms of wealth management flows, and uh, we are uh, really looking forward to uh, a, a revival of uh, perhaps uh, IPO volumes in Hong Kong mm. uh, uh, in response to uh, increasing corporate financing needs uh, from the mainland China. Uh, it's an interesting line that came out about how much bankers get paid here in Hong Kong yep. versus Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been crunching the numbers, and it, it actually, you know, you could actually see a pretty decent bump up if you if you stay in Hong Kong versus Moon the Lion City. Um, What's that, driving that? That uh, I would say uh, is uh, a set of numbers uh, uh, dated back maybe 2023. Uh, obviously, uh, different uh, news flows coming in uh, in terms of investment bankers lay off or say, uh, uh, something. Yeah. But uh, investment bankers in Hong Kong, they, they may still be making more than their Singaporean counterparts just because of the deal flows from mainland China, the deal size, such and such. Okay, yeah. Up to maybe 46% more potentially here. 36% uh, more if you're an associate in Hong Kong. Certainly some interesting numbers there. Francis Chan, thank you. Our Bloomberg thank Intelligence you. Banking much, and Chan. FinTech senior analyst. Make sure to check out his team's deep dive into that <laughs> race between Singapore and Hong Kong. I think we only just kind of scraped the surface, really, of what he says. Basically, there's a lot of segments here where there's really no contest. There's, they win in different ways. Bell. Yeah, that's right. And I guess one of the questions that perhaps is answered in that report is just the permanency of the shift as well that people can be really focused on. But we're going to have more, as we we're discussing with Francis there, those HSBC results, because the CEO, Noel Quinn, is joining us later. That interview is happening at 1.30 p.m. Hong Kong time. That's 5.30 a.m. if you're watching from London. But it's not just the focus on HSBC's earnings. Also, a big earning that is due out Wednesday after the bell in the U.S. is NVIDIA, Yvonne. And, and this chip maker we've just discussed there's so many times times of the past year, given that huge run-up we have seen in the stock price. Uh, yesterday, though, in the session, we actually saw a bit of a drop ahead of it. Uh, we do see, at least in options, telling us we could see quite a lot of volatility here. But that was the biggest decline that we'd seen in about four months yeah. for the company. So just a lot of focus on the stock, whether all of this promise around AI, the hype of the technology, whether that's actually going to be able to to be realized yeah. in those numbers. You look at the options market and what they're saying, right? Look at this size and scope. Uh, they're implying a 10 and a half percent move. It could either be either way. Post earnings, that is the biggest one day move after those results came in since what we saw back in May of last year when they posted those first quarter earnings and the stock moved 24 percent up right so it's going to be pretty volatile to say the least but as we talk about you know every single time we look at this print is, is that it, it's a great company but the stock has just gone price for perfection in many ways so. absolutely yeah like a lot of um, a lot of u.s equities here but nvidia is really the poster child for that uh, still though that that focus of course nvidia is one of the names that is sort of caught between the the, the chip tensions between the u.s and china right. does take about a third of its revenue from mainland china and and that's something that we really watch quite closely in this region as well given that uh, there are major chip makers major chip supplies material supplies and, and japan is really at the center of that as well. Yeah, they're trying to be that alternative market, right? And the country is embarking on its most ambitious chip development program to date. It's looking to leverage U.S. concerns over supply chain security and return to a game it once dominated. Chitose Hokkaido, the foundations are being laid for the revival of an industry Japan once dominated. In three years' time, it's intended there will be an advanced chip-making foundry on this site, producing cutting-edge two nanometer chips. Currently, advanced chip manufacturers concentrated in a handful of countries. There are geopolitical, economic, security factors involved. To survive as a nation, Japan needs to be a global main player with technology. We can clearly demonstrate that with semiconductors. As electric vehicles, AI and advanced weapons development spur demand, the U.S. is encouraging its allies to shore up supply chains and limit the risk of over-reliance on China. 
Because of the geopolitical risk between China and Taiwan, we are not expanding in mainland China. We are building a large factory in Thailand. Also, our presence in Germany and Japan is increasing. Taiwanese circuit board maker Unimicron has been operating here for some time. And now, with government-backed Rapidus setting up, the longer-term vision is to build Hokkaido's version of Silicon Valley. Further south in Kumamoto, the world's largest chipmaker TSMC has a $7 billion factory gearing up for production and another one in the pipeline. The Japanese government is pouring $28 billion into its chip revival strategy, with the city of Chitose experiencing a property boom as a result. Companies and manufacturers have been moving overseas, and now we are beginning to see a trend towards a return to Japan. I believe Rapidus is exactly the kind of business development that will give young people the opportunity to make different choices in their hometowns. At the moment, Japan has a shortage of skilled chip industry workers to move in once the construction crews move out. The hope is, build it and they will come. Paul Allen, Bloomberg. Just take a quick look, quick look rather, at uh, mainland markets as we get 20 minutes into the session so far. Pretty different fortunes we're really seeing here. You've got the CSI 300 a little bit under pressure, but we've seen the other index now very much into positive territory. We'll have more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Right, entering the markets here today. So it looks like we have some big earnings to come up uh, here when it comes to HSBC, Hang Seng Bank, Trip.com. Those are the next three. Uh, but we are seeing the lenders at least up one about 1% 1 for Hang Seng Bank here leading up to that leaning. Uh, that's up now 2%. Uh, that was an interesting call from the Goldman Sachs who we just talked to Michelle Chang about, worried about what this means for when it comes to margins uh, and the like here. They're downgrading that stock to neutral. And in terms of what we're looking at, well, it's really about one big earnings report, NVIDIA, that could really shake up the tech space here today. With the HS Tech, though, really reversing some of the initial losses that we saw at the open, we're now actually back up. And you're taking a look at when it comes to chip stocks, the like here, and really how NVIDIA is going to dictate what the next few sessions are going to look like here. You take a look at the tech space, there you go. Lenovo's up some 4 percent. JD is up close to 2 percent, Bell. Yeah, it's been a pretty interesting session so far, but it is that focus, as you said, on NVIDIA earnings, which is why it's making it so interesting that we're actually seeing that Hang Seng Tech, you can see they're trading up 1.4% so far. Uh, what else we're tracking in the session today is that continued market reaction to the LPR move from yesterday. Disappointed investors, and you are continuing to see the CSI 300 just a little bit under pressure so far. But we're going to have more ahead in the next hour. We're live from the Singapore Air Show with interviews including Cebu Pacific Air. Uh, CEO.